Hey, what's up, guys? It's Timothy here. Um, I'm we're we're looking at day two spoilers for Amonkhet, and I'm gonna go ahead and start this video off with just a little bit of a rant, or at least um, an opinion that you're more than welcome to disagree with. And if you think uh, I'm wrong about it, go ahead and leave a comment below, and we can kind of discuss it before you know this set comes out and we start playing with these cards. But um, let's go ahead and read the spoiler that we have here, um, Sacred Cat, because it kind of lends itself towards what I'm about to say. Um, Sacred Cat is one white mana for a one one cat at common and it has lifelink and embalm for one white mana meaning if it's in the graveyard you can pay a white mana and exile it to get uh this thing right here just an, a one one lifelink uh zombie cat token right um just like all the rest of the embalm cards you get a copy of whatever you're exiling with embalm now <clears throat> uh, my honest opinion is i look at a card like sacred cat and i see a very weak card i think this card is very close to just bad um, it has a little bit of utility because it is like all the rest of the Embalm creatures. It is a natural two for one. You are at some point going to get two bodies off of the same card, um, assuming that it dies. And a 1-1 one, one will die at some point in the game. But uh, I don't think the impact on this card is really here. And uh, I'm saying that for a lot of these Embalm cards. that I've, I haven't seen one that really blows me away yet. Um, part of the reason I'm saying that is because the Embalm costs are pretty expensive. Obviously, I can't say that about... Uh, sacred cat but some of them are upwards around five mana and you're getting a pretty good deal off of it but the thing that makes a good embalm card i think is a creature that's going to be able to trade in combat and then you're going to be able to embalm it back later in the game and be up a card when i see sacred cat i just see a roadblock for your opponent sacred cat might deal one or two damage throughout the course of a game lifelink that much damage to you and then it's just going to have to block it's very very rarely going to trade with a creature and when you embalm it, you're not really improving it. You're not getting anything different than the creature you just lost. So if Sacred Cat doesn't do much, then I don't see the uh, Cat Token doing very much either from the graveyard. Um, this does get pretty interesting if you have a payoff for having a lot of tokens. Maybe there's some sort of card that says whenever you embalm something, do X. And if that's a pretty good payoff, then I could see really wanting a card like this. But this is a weak card. Um... And I see the reason I'm starting off with this little rant about Sacred Cats because I, I looked at comments and people were like, wow, this card's fantastic. Like, it's great. It's standard playable. I, this is a weak card. If there's no payoff for embalming it, this is just not impactful in a limited game of Magic. Or I see it being very, very weak um, throughout the course of the game, unless there are a lot of X1s, which we haven't seen a lot of yet. So I don't know. My, my opinion is don't play Sacred Cat. <laughs> uh, but whatever uh did i call it something else i think i might have just called it something else besides sacred cat but anyway um my opinion is stay away from it um i'm not saying that about embalm in general but if you're not getting a huge advantage off of the embalm creature and the creatures are just not going to add up to a lot of damage they're not going to be able to pressure your opponent then i don't really see the point of um spending all your mana later in the game to get them back and if you're not getting a significant creature off of them then uh, I don't know. If if the token is not doing anything more than the original creature you had, then uh, I don't know. I just don't see it being that useful. But I don't know. We'll have to see how it all plays out. There, I'm sure Embalm is just an attrition-based mechanic where you want to be able to trade off creatures and one-up your opponent by bringing them back, essentially, uh, in later turns. But I don't know how feasible that's going to be if the Embalm creatures are all on the smaller side. Um, anyway, moving on, we have <laughs> other cards to look at today. Uh, we have a sorcery for one in a black called Lay Bear the Heart. I don't know, whatever. Some weird, like, he's pulling, that, that's not where the heart's located. But anyway, uh, target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-legendary, non-land card from it. That player discards that card. In Limited, I'm not a huge fan of these type of uh, discard spells. Every now and then, people play them against me, and it's just... They might get a card, but I don't really feel that bad. It never does more than just one-for-ones. Um, I'm thinking cards like Harsh Scrutiny, Duress, things like that, that you could main board them, and a, a good percentage of the time, you'll get a card out of them from your opponent. And, you know, a small percentage of time you might brick, but even when you do get a card out of your opponent, it's not, like, super impactful. All you've done is used a card from your hand to get your opponent's best card, and they could just draw 
into something even better, right? Right. I would rather prioritize um, actual removal spells or spells that universally deal with things than discard spells. Not to mention, and I mention this every time we get, see a spoiler like this, these make for really, really terrible top decks. If your opponent has no cards, everybody's hellbent, and you're in a top deck war, you lose if you draw this card and your opponent draws a relevant spell. Um, the non-legendary thing's interesting. That, I guess that's their quirky way of making it uh, non-conditional. Besides uh, having some minor cause that won't matter a good percentage of the time, but it's there and it's worth mentioning. Um, I don't like the card though, and it's an uncommon, which is uh, not necessary. I think Harsh Scrutiny was also an uncommon. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we have another Aftermath card here to prepare to fight. They're all blank to blank uh, instead of um, split cards, which were uh, blank and blank. These are all blank to blank, so prepared to fight. You get the point, right? Um, anyway, uh, I've also another interesting thing about um, aftermath cards that we haven't mentioned yet is that the first mode, the um, upright mode that you can cast from your hand, is always an instant, and it appears that the uh, aftermath part, the one that you cast from the graveyard, is always a sorcery. So that's something to note there too. Anyway, uh, the first half of this prepared for one in a white. Untapped target creature, it gains plus two, plus two, and has a lifelink until end of turn, which I think is a decent combat trick. Plus two, plus two, and the untap is enough to get your opponent, and I think is probably why we're justifying this as a rare here, even though I don't think this is an exciting rare. And then you have a fight, which is uh, um, literally fight, right? It's a target creature you control, fights target creature an opponent controls. A four mana... Um, prey upon, so to speak. In fact, that's exactly what it is. But uh, I don't know if that's a really hefty cause, uh, cost for a fight effect. Like, that's not even a good fight effect. And combining these together costs six mana, which I would not pay... I don't know. I, I would not be happy paying six mana for plus two, plus two lifelink and fight, even though I think most of the times you cast that, if your opponent's not like holding up a bunch of removal spells, that'll be enough to give you a pretty big advantage. But six mana is a lot for a fight ability, just going to be able to kill off one creature um, and gain you a little bit of life. I like this more as a separate card, and that's the idea, obviously. Sure, you can combine them in the same turn, but I like... Um, the effect here on prepared, I think, fights a lot worse because of how expensive it is. We've noticed in a lot of recent sets that if fight spells don't give you a boost, then they don't pan out as well as you would like for them to. And uh, it's kind of awkward that this is also a white-green card where uh, you probably want the white effect more than you do the green. It is nice that you get a little removal spell on top of a combat trick, but I don't see these two like really working in conjunction that often. Not to mention, if this is in the graveyard, your opponent knows you have access to a fight effect and can play around it a lot easier than they would something like Prey Upon if they weren't aware that you had it in your hand. So a lot of interesting things going on with that card. I think it's a little bit on the weaker side for a rare. I could see this being an uncommon and being like a perfectly playable uh, fine card. But I don't know about rare. Um, consuming Fervor. Uh, one red for an uncommon aura, enchant creature, gets plus three plus three and has at the beginning of your upkeep put a minus one minus one counter on your creature, um, on this creature. Um, and you can enchant your opponent's creature if you want to like kill it over time, I guess. But a lot of times you'll put this on your own creature just to get a huge burst of power out of it. Plus three plus three is a lot for one mana. So this functions as like a lightning bolt or something like built to smash if you put it on a creature at the right time um and a little over time you're getting a little bit of incremental advantage too so the turn after you play this your creature's still getting plus two plus two and then the turn after that plus one plus one and then the turn after that it's back at parity so you essentially get you know four turns without this being um a downgrade in any way shape or form but you need to make that damage matter because at some point your creature is going to kill itself or it's going to get so um small off the minus one minus one counters that it won't matter obviously at one red this is geared towards aggressive decks so if that's what you're trying to build i can see maybe wanting one of these but i don't know it's the same kind of problem as auras and it doesn't give trample or anything like that so you can still chump and just wait for this creature to kill itself um but it's interesting i, I give them points for being unique on this type of card we see this pretty often like some big boost but it's usually an instant i like it as an enchantment and uh it is worth noting if you have anything that cares about minus one minus one counters then uh this gets a little bit better like that uh what is it the nest of scarabs or something like that even putting minus one minus one counters on your own creatures 
um, triggers that thing, so that's pretty nice. Splendid Agony. <laughs> what a name. Um, two and a black for a common instant. Distribute two minus one minus one counters among one or two target creatures. So if you boil this down to what it technically is, it's three mana to give a creature minus two minus two, um, but that's a permanent minus two minus two. And then being able to split that up just means there's a little bit more flexibility. So this functions a lot like cards that we've seen before, um, things like Cruel Finality, um, things like, um, I don't know, uh, I can't think of the name of the card from Cons of Tarkir. Uh, douse and gloom that's it um but this one has a little bit more flexibility and the nice thing here is if this doesn't kill a creature or if it's not enough to kill a creature it at least weakens them permanently to the point where you could uh kill them in combat or something like that i think a lot of people um see cards like cruel finality like these minus two minus two effects or something like that and they shortcut it in their head that they're removal spells and they see something like a 3-3 three, three that it won't kill and they think oh well i can't use this on that creature it doesn't kill it but you can use it in the middle of combat to make a favorable trade and i think this has a lot of potential um being able to put two counters on your opponent's creatures in the middle of combat could really turn a game if uh, your opponent's not prepared for it. So note that this card exists so you don't get blown out by it during pre-release, but I think it's a good card. Um, three mana for minus two, minus two isn't like uh, premium removal, but it is playable, um, and it seems like a decent card. Uh, definitely above filler, although I'm sure there will be better removal um, in black. Moving along, Exemplar of Strength. One in a green for a 4-4, four, four, wait for the downside, uh, uncommon human warrior, wait, mm, excuse me, when they enter the battlefield, put three minus one minus one counters on target creature you control, it doesn't have to be the exemplar, whenever the exemplar of strength attacks, remove a minus one minus one counter from it, if you do, you gain a life, so the idea here is you're getting a really beefy creature, but you have to uh, build it up over time, a lot of times if you're playing this on turn two, you're going to have to put the Excuse me, you're going to have to put the counters on the Exemplar herself, and you're going to have to attack with it turn after turn, hoping that maybe it doesn't trade, um, <clears throat> and then remove the counter slowly with the ability here. It's also nice that um, some effects that ask you to put counters on your own creatures can be used in conjunction with this. Like, for instance, the um, aura we just saw is really nice um, in tandem with this card because it'll get a minus one, minus one counter every turn, but the uh, ability on this is a built-in way to... Uh, combat that and even gain a little bit of life off of it it's also worth noting um sometimes you can go one drop and then follow up with this thing and put the counters on the one drop and then you're just left with a two mana four four which is really strong and doesn't require a lot of setup but i think the majority of times you play this you'll put the counters on itself hopefully on turn two and you'll start attacking and uh slowly getting a bigger creature while also gaining a little bit of life i think this is a pretty rad card i don't know how good it's going to be um, that is a pretty big downside too. Uh, and I think I, I didn't read it thoroughly, but I think if your opponent, like your opponent can really mess it up. Um, if you play that card and your opponent responds to the enter the battlefield trigger by removing it, never mind. I, I was going to say that might force you to put your counters on another creature, but that doesn't actually work that way. Uh, you choose the creature you want to put the counters on, um, and that won't change if your opponent kills the creature in response. But anyway, uh, next card, Ta'Krop Elite is three and a white for a common 2-2 bird warrior with flying. You may exert Ta'Krop Elite as it attacks. When you do, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This strikes me as a good card. Um, it gets its own boost, which is pretty nice. So it attacks as a 3-3 flyer for four, which is a pretty solid card. Um, and then it just pumps your whole team. If you're able to go wide enough, this is a lot of payoff for a card like this. Um, and a common, too. Uh, remember that exert has the downside of um, if you choose to exert it, it doesn't untap during the next turn. But uh, if you can give this vigilance or something like that or have a way to untap it, um, that seems pretty strong. And we've actually seen two white spells, two instants so far, that untap a creature you control, which uh, works very, very nicely in conjunction with Exert, since it's a way to get around that not tapping thing during your next turn. But this seems like a very solid card. I think this is actually a pretty strong flyer. Um, and it depends really on how wide you can go, but the fact that it attacks as a 3-3 flyer for 4 is already okay in my book. 
Uh, Onward to Victory is our next uh, Aftermath card. Uh, I forget what they're calling these. I, it might just be Aftermath cards. Uh, I can't remember if they had a vernacular name for it or anything. But Onward to Victor Victory. The uh, first part from your hand is two and a red for an uncommon instant. Target creature gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is its power. That's okay. Um, that can be used to end a game, or if you have really large creatures, it's good, or really big tramplers. But overall, not having a toughness boost is not really the most exciting thing in the world to me. The victory part from the graveyard with Aftermath is a two and a white target creature gains double strike until end of turn. Now that being a sorcery really hurts it. It means your opponent is prepared for it when it happens. The same goes for pretty much anything. Not to mention um, if you've cast onward, then they just know you have victory in the graveyard anyway, and they can play around it. It's not like you're going to be able to double strike something at instant speed like uh, Team or Battle Rage and just win the game out of nowhere. You might be able to, but maybe not. Um, if you can pay six mana total and put this on a trampler, that's just game, right? But uh, that's not going to happen very often. I don't think this is super strong. Um, I don't think four mana sorcery speed for double strike is really that good. Uh, since it's not a permanent effect and it just encourages your opponent to chump block for the turn. Um, and I also don't think three mana for this type of uh, boost is really that good either. Unless you're using it to uh, close a gap in life totals or win a race or something like that. But I don't know. Um, the cards are flexible enough that you could see them in a white-red deck. But I don't really see it here. Uh, I think the card's good. Um, I just don't think it's super powerful. Um, I don't know. Flexibility, again, matters. But... I just don't think the card's that, that good. Uh, I don't know. Prove me wrong again. <laughs> I keep saying that. Prove me wrong. I'm down on a lot of these cards. Not not uh, personally, but just if I'm being completely like honest about my opinion when I see the card, I'm just throwing it out there. Um, Scribe of the Mindful is two and a blue for a 2-2 two -two common human cleric. For one mana, you can tap it and sack it to return an instant or sorcery from your graveyard to your hand. Um, this is actually pretty sweet with the Aftermath cards because it lets you reuse the Sorcery Speed version and then it also goes back to the graveyard so you get the additional option to Aftermath it. Um, and I don't know, if you have good spells in your deck, this is a card that you would want to consider if you're playing blue and if you're not spell heavy at all, you just don't play the card. So not much to say about it. It is a little bit on the weaker side for its mana cost, but if you have a good payoff for it, if you have a good reason to be getting instance sorceries back from your graveyard or some like bomb removal spell or something like that, then sure, you run the card. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Moving right along, right along. Um, these videos always take a very long time. Uh, oh yeah, we have a play set of monuments here. So I'm not going to click any one in particular here, but uh, I do want to make sure you can see them all. Um, looks like we're going to have to scroll up for one. But the way the monuments work is this is a whole cycle. There's one tied to each um, uh, color of creature, but you do not have to necessarily play them in that deck. So I'm going to give you kind of the basis here. Each one is uncommon. Each one is a legendary artifact, so you can't have multiples of the same one on the battlefield, but you could put multiples, or you could put uh, multiple different ones out. They each cost three mana to cast, and they each say um, some color of creatures costs one less to cast. They all say that for each different color. And then they have a different ability whenever you cast a creature. So Kefnet, which is the blue god, says whenever you cast a creature, target creature an opponent controls doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Warning, that does not tap the creature down. If you read it closely, it never says tap that creature. And I promise that'll come up in games where people think it does that. So make sure you are aware Kefnet's monument does not tap creatures. It just stops creatures that are already tapped from untapping, um, which is not super powerful. But if you can take advantage of that blue creatures cost in one less, this card justifies itself, I think. It functions as a mana rock for blue creatures, which isn't terrible. Um, Oketra, which is the white god, Oketra's monument is three and white creatures cost one less whenever you cast a creature spell create a one one white warrior creature token with vigilance now this i think is really strong every creature comes attached with a one one uh vigilant token that's a very good way to go wide if you're playing a super low curve deck this is really strong not to mention it makes your creatures easier to cast like all the rest here too so you should be able to flood the board with an army in no time if you're a very creature heavy deck i think this one is very strong and keep in mind you do not 
not have to be playing a white deck to take advantage of this ability. Um, the first part won't matter if you're not in a white deck, but the second part still will if you're a creature-heavy deck that's not necessarily playing white. Bantu, uh, the croc god, is the black one. Bantu's monument is three mana, and it says black creatures cost one less. Whenever you cast a creature spell, your opponent loses a life and you gain a life. This one I don't think is nearly as strong as Oketra's monument, since, uh, you know, it might drain six, seven life throughout the course of a game, um, which isn't irrelevant at all, but it's just not a hugely impactful thing. A lot of times you play this, and it's not going to have an effect on the board, so... Um, it's not really going to sway things in one direction or another. But again, if you're a really low curve deck, or maybe you're a really late game deck with a lot of like really high toughness creatures and you're trying to get to some bomb, this can help you gain a little bit of life or help uh, ease your opponent down to a comfortable life total so your finisher can really win the game. I don't think it's terrible, but it's definitely not the best in this cycle. The red one, Hazaret's Monument, is three red creatures cost one less. And whenever you cast a creature, you may discard if you do draw a card. I like this one quite a bit. Um, I, I th actually think this one's really good. Whenever you cast a creature, you get to rummage. That seems really sweet to me. Um, it, it really helps mitigate uh, land flood, like these loot abilities often do. I say rummage, that's when you discard first and then you draw as opposed to looting, which is the other way around. But this one seems pretty sweet. You don't have to use it. Um, it makes your creatures cost less in the most aggressive color, which is pretty nice. It means you uh, should be able to dump pretty high-cost creatures. Um, you could get to the point where you're putting uh, haymakers down during the same turn or something like that. But I like the ability on this one. Just the rummaging ability, um, if you've played with Reckless Racer in... Um, Ether Revolt, it's just, it's really good. It helps uh, pull a game in your favor. It helps you draw more spells than your opponent. And a lot of times, the person who draws more spells than their opponent is the one who wins. Um, that's just how things turn out. And then, finally, we have uh, Ronas' Monument, the Snake God. Uh, green creatures cost one less. Whenever you cast a creature spell, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample until end of turn so you know put this in your animar decks or whatever um ronus's monument seems good um i do think oketra's monument is probably the best the red and the green ones seem pretty good too i think the blue and black one are a little bit on the weaker side but i really like this one green usually has really big creatures too so being able to cast those for cheaper is a lot nicer than it would be to cast your blue creatures for cheaper generally speaking and then plus two plus two and trample is pretty nice not to mention if you're able to cast multiple creatures in the same turn you're getting a pretty big boost or you can you know spread trample out across a lot of your team so i think this one is very powerful in the right kind of deck but you need to be creature heavy for these deck cards to really matter if you find that you're running maybe like 11 creatures 11 spells or something like that then these cards go way way down in value but they are things that i think i would pick up early and i'd be excited to play in the right kind of shell um, Essence Scatter is a reprint. Uh, it's one in a blue to counter a creature spell at instant speed. It's a common. Um, this is the type of counter spell I would actually main deck. I'm not a big fan of counter spells in Limited, but games of Limited are won by creatures, so Essence Scatter will 99.9% uh, .9 of the time have a target and will hit something good, and it's efficient enough to do that. It's the it's like negate. You can main deck negate and almost always hit a spell or have access have the uh, ability to hit a spell. Essence scatters even more likely than that. Um, but the earlier you have it, the better. Um, it's also a very nice little tempo card to stop your opponent from keeping parity on the board if you're able to keep up mana for it. Decision Paralysis is two, I'm sorry, three and a blue for a common instant top up to two target creatures. Those creatures don't untap during their controller's next untap step. So you freeze two creatures uh, for a turn, essentially, um, or two turns if you do it at the right time. I don't like these kind of effects if they're too costly and they don't have any extra bonus. I like when these sort of effects give you a scry or a draw on top of them, but this one doesn't do that. It's just tap two creatures. So uh, I don't think this one's very good. Um, it does combo pretty nicely with the blue monument, but I don't know. I, I just think it's a little bit on the weaker side. I would probably stay away from this, but if I knew that I was just hurting for some sort of tempo play, again, I have some big bomb I want to get to at the end of the game, then this is the type of card I might look towards. But for right now, I would say stay away from it. It's just not super impactful. It does affect the board, but not permanently. I don't know. Uh, we have a rare here. Channeler Initiate. 
initiate is one in a green for a 3-4 rare human druid when it enters the battlefield put three minus one minus one counters on target creature you control just like the last guy um the other green creature we saw and you can tap to remove a counter from it a minus one minus one counter to add any color to your mana pool i really like this card i think this card is awesome it adds any color so it's a mana fixer um, it's a good place to dump minus one, minus one counters if you have things like that crocodile or uh, things that care about having to put counters on your own creatures. It uh, slowly turns from a mana torque into an actual creature over the course of a good number of turns. By the time you've removed all the counters and you no longer need it for mana, it's got a decent sized body that's willing to rumble, right? A 3-4 is not bad. And then there's always the case where you can put counters on another creature you control and then just have this coming as a 2-mana 3-4. So really solid card here. Um, I like it i really like mana dorks and if you're gonna make a rare then at least make it something like this i think this is a highly highly playable card um i think it's actually quite strong uh wrapping it up here we got about four more to go this one i really like um i was kind of started this video off by trashing embalm but this card's sweet uh temet i guess is how you would pronounce it temet vizier of noctamon <laughs> what a name uh one white and one blue for two two so a legendary bear it is a legendary creature it is a human cleric it is a rare and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn target creature token you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn that's a pretty huge effect and then you can also embalm it for three white and a blue this is the only card we've seen so far with embalm that isn't just mono white so uh interesting to see if embalm will be in other colors or not or if it's just this card and nice little token here but this is a cool card it has a lot going for it so um it makes your embalmed token creatures unblockable or at least one per turn um if you have a decent one to bring back then this is a nice uh card to have in conjunction with it this is also the type of card that you pick up and you start prioritizing embalmed creatures a little bit more it works with other tokens too um, even though we haven't seen a ton of those, but um, even little 1-1 one, one soldier tokens can get the boost here. And the unblockable is the huge part. Plus 1, plus 1 on top of that is pretty good. And then th keep in mind, when this thing embalms and it comes back as a token, it can now target itself with its own ability, which is pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> I like that they have to... There, there's so much text on this card that they have to uh, say <laughs> Vizier of Noctamon is legendary instead of putting it up here. Legendary Toker Creature, Zombie Human Cleric. That is a lot for the type line. Um, but this comes back as essentially a 3-3 unblockable creature, which can close out a game very quickly if your opponent can't deal in it with it. Um, so I like this guy. I think this is good. I think this is a really strong embalm card and a good reason to start prioritizing embalm cards. Uh, pretty exciting. I like it. I always like the legendary creatures they put in sets. Um, they give you... A nice little sense of flavor and uh, a unique like build around to your rares. Um, I like it. I think this is a good card. Uh, Drake Haven. <laughs> Drake Haven is three and a blue for a rare enchantment. Whenever you cycle or discard a card, you may pay one. If you do, create a two-two blue Drake creature with flying. Uh, this seems like a good payoff for cycling. Um, I don't know how much cycling there's going to be in blue, but uh, this seems like a very good payoff for it. 2-2 uh, two, two, every time you discard a card or cycle a card for one mana. So if you have a cycling card in your hand, you're essentially paying two to cycle it and then one extra and you get a drake on top of that. That seems really good. Um, not to mention, like, this isn't really that steep of a cost that you can't afford to take turn three off and just put this on the battlefield. Looking at the set so far... I don't think this set is anywhere near like triple Kaladesh. I think you are going to have some room to play silly cards like this and just take over the late game. And then you open this as your rare. You start prioritizing loot effects that let you discard and draw. You start prioritizing cycle abilities, so on and so forth. And this can get really out of control if you uh, manage to build around it correctly. If you only have three or four ways in your deck to even discard, then I'd be a little bit off of it, but I like it. Um, it works in conjunction with the red obelisk, where every time you cast a creature, you can discard a card to draw one, pay a mana, get a drake. Uh, pretty good stuff, right? Um, I think this card's sweet. I'm excited to see whether it pans out and is actually a strong card, or if I'm just overhyping it a little bit. Uh, what I won't be overhyping, I think, is this card, Cast Out. Um, apparently we're going to zoom a little bit. <laughs> uh, almost done with the spoilers for today. Cast Out is 3 and a white for an enchantment, an uncommon enchantment with flash. 
When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until cast out leaves the battlefield. You can cycle it for one white. Um, so really cheap cycling cost, but I don't think you're going to cycle this card very often. This has a... Uh, a very good effect this is your um o-ring type effect so to speak your oblivion ring of the set and putting flash on an o-ring is pretty nice i think it justifies the uh pseudo expensive um four mana um this is just unconditional removal not just for creatures but this hits non-land permanents too which is pretty sweet it's uh, a nice little way to get rid of a certain embalm target without making it go to the graveyard which is also worth mentioning um, and then if it's completely useless, you always have the cycling option on it, but this is just good removal, um, for limited at least, and Flash is really exciting on a card like this. This is probably going to be one of the best white uncommons in the set. Um, normally when you see cards like this, whether they're common or uncommon, they just play out very, very well, and I have reason to believe that it'll do so again. And then finally, we have our blue god, uh, I already forgot the name, ah, Kefnet, Kef Kefnet. Um, they didn't actually show us the masterpiece today, though, which is a little sad, but Kefnet the Careful. I don't think that's his actual name. I think it's a Kef Kefnet the, uh, um, I don't remember. It's I don't think it's Careful, though. But anyway, um, the card is two and a blue for a 5-5 five, five legendary god creature. It has flying and indestructible. Remember, they're all indestructible, and they all have some other keyword, some generic, you know, color-based keyword. Uh, it can't attack or block unless you have seven or more cards in hand. For three and a blue, you may draw a card. Then you may return a land you control to its owner's hand. Now, this part right here, seven or more cards in hand, is a lot harder than it sounds for limited. Normally, if you're able to consistently keep seven or more cards in your hand uh, throughout the course of a game, you probably already won or your mana screwed. Um... But, I don't know. The activated ability is nice here. It essentially gets the option to put two cards into your hand. You draw one, which is already decent. Four mana to draw a card is fine. Um, if this was just an enchantment that said four mana draw a card, I wouldn't be that happy about it, since it's not relevant um, in combat or anything like that, and it takes up a lot of your mana to be able to do that. You may not be able to activate it very often, but that's a decent ability on top of a card that can occasionally become a 5-5 five, five flyer and attack not to mention if you have any reason to be returning lands to your hand. Maybe you have, I don't know, something that cares about lands entering the battlefield or lands in your hand. I don't know. If, if something cares about you removing a land from the battlefield, this seems like a decent card. And um, just wanted to mention, in standard, Battle for Zendikar is still around. Oath of the Gatewatch is still around. So it'd be interesting to see if this does anything with landfall, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to pull this card off very often. Um, in limited, just having seven cards in your hand is asking a good bit, since uh, by the time you cast this, even on turn three, you'll probably have four or five cards in hand. And um, if your opponent deals with this and you've just been sandbagging cards, you're going to be way behind. But I don't know, if you ever get up to seven by turn four and you start slamming, this is a four-turn clock that starts attacking on turn four. So pretty strong, but um, very hard to pull off. Um, I think it's significantly worse than the Red God. But, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would be excited to try it out. Um, I don't know how competitive it's going to be. Like, if I were at a high-stakes tournament and I open one and maybe some other good card, I might consider something else over it just because I know having seven cards in my hand um, to make this an active attacker or blocker is going to be asking quite a bit. But anyway, uh, lots of talking. I'm so sorry. Um, hope you guys are at least getting something out of this. My key takeaways today is I would be interested to see what you guys think of Embalm as a mechanic and see if you think I'm underrating it or underselling it and uh, what you guys think of the Blue God as opposed to the Red God. But anyway, uh, this video has gone on long enough. I thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to watch it. And uh, as always, my name is Timothy, and I'll see you all next time.